Well, welcome everybody. My name is Tamar Friedman and on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I want to thank you all for joining us today for a very special briefing about how to help Holocaust survivors and a commemoration that will talk about how to memory and how to keep the memory important, the important life stories and memories of survivors um, alive and vibrant for us to keep on learning from. Um, and so welcome, especially today on Yom HaShoah. It's really or the eve of Yom HaShoah. It's really important for us to come together as a community to, to do this together. And with that, I would like to introduce Andre Spaconi, the president and CEO of Jewish Funders Network, to say a few words and to, and to introduce our first speakers. Thank you, Andres. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope everybody, first of all, is safe and healthy and that your families and loved ones are uh, going over these crazy times as sanely as, as possible. And um, thank you, Tamar, and um, and thank you all for joining. I, you know, this is an issue that is very, very close to my heart personally. So um, I'm going to be a little biased here. I think saying that this issue is really of key importance for the Jewish community. Um, I think that the I, I will I will share on a personal note that discovering the plight of Holocaust survivors. In, in in Eastern Europe. Can you please, those that are not on speaking, can you mute your phones because there's background noise? Thank you. We're, we're all learning how to do Zoom uh, protocol better. Um, so I was saying that this is an issue that for me is, is very is very close to my heart. I would even say, say that the plight of Holocaust survivors that I saw firsthand in Eastern Europe, um, it made me a Jewish communal professional. Is seeing the the suffering of these folks uh, that that convinced me that I wanted to dedicate my life to to the Jewish people. So this is this is very close to my heart. I also think that a society, a country, a community is judged not by its military might, not by its wealth, not by its works of art, by, but almost exclusively by the way in which it takes care of the more vulnerable populations in their midst. So the way we treat our Holocaust survivors that are probably the most vulnerable populations that we, that we have in our community reflects on all of us, on each of all of us, and 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 it and it sets the character uh, and the values of our community. Uh, luckily, I mean, there's 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 bad news and bad news and good news. The bad news is that Holocaust survivors are are suffering in many parts of the world, even in this country. Um, the good news is that there there's a lot of a ton of goodwill people. Uh, working to alleviate their plight, you know, for for decades now, the claims conference and, you know, uh, have been working on this issue and federations all over the country are working very hard on this issue forever. And in the last few years, a coalition of funders led by, led by my dear friends, Joel and uh, Greenberg and, and Marcy Greenglass have uh, taken up the, the, this challenge of helping Holocaust survivors in any way they can by creating a coalition of funders that um, adds, you know, significantly to the menu of, 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 of services that Holocaust survivors receive around the country and around the world. So I hope that this, that this webinar, that this encounter, that this somber uh, date of Yom HaShoah uh, makes us more sensitive, not just to the memory of the Holocaust, but to the plight of Holocaust survivors in our midst. They are all our family and we are all in a way uh, their spiritual and even physical heirs. So with that, I'm gonna give it, I gotta give the floor to uh, Joel and Marcy from the Seed the Dream Foundations uh, that have started, they're gonna tell us about it in, in their own words, but 
they've started a coalition of funders uh, that seeks to really ramp up the support that the community is giving to Holocaust survivors around the world. Uh, so, Marcy, floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Anders. That was beautiful. And um, thanks, everyone, for um, joining in today. Um, it's actually really wonderful to see all these faces and um, to feel like that as we are all in our own separate corners, bedrooms, offices, home offices, that we are coming together um, on this day, especially today, um, Yom HaShoah, where we we're pausing, we're pausing, just as Andre so beautifully said, to remember those that we lost and also honor those who survived. And I wanna thank you, Andres, for being at the forefront and helping us bring this issue forward um, through your leadership. And you've been helping through um, to bring attention to the critical needs of Holocaust survivors in the United States and, and Israel and around the world. So how did we get here? Around seven, not, not we, the Holocaust survivors, but we, um, Joel and I, how did we get here? We, seven years ago um, in Philadelphia, we were approached to support the need for home care and emergency care for survivors in our community. And we actually had not known that there was such a need. And um, obviously this is an important issue to the Jewish community and on a personal level, it's a very important issue and near and dear to our hearts as my parents, both thankfully alive um, and, and isolated in Florida, are, um, um, are, both, are both survivors. And um, we began to investigate as we learned that there, this was an issue, we began, whoops, did I lose everyone? Did I, did I lose everyone? No, okay. No, you're still there, I'm sorry. Okay, um, no, my screen went, went um, crazy. Um, so we began to investigate the numbers and this this idea of that there were suffering in our in our own community. And we, as I said, we had no idea. We began to learn more about what we've now begun to see as a silent crisis. So, for numbers today in the in the United States, there are eighty thousand survivors, and one third of those are living in poverty. One hundred sixty thousand survivors are living in Israel, and more than sixty thousand are living in poverty. And for many of us, until we see this silent suffering firsthand, it is impossible to believe. As we started to dig deeper into this issue, we learned that far too many survivors lack, are lacking access to medicine or food or quality care or rent money. Um, we learned that this is a crisis across the country here and in Israel and anywhere in the world where there are survivors. And we also learned that their needs far outweigh the available resources. And we learned that organizations, agencies, Jewish family social service providers, federations are scrambling to raise funds and provide services. And we learned that these aging seniors are made to choose between things like food or home repairs here in the United States, and in Israel, choosing between adult diapers and nursing care. We also learned that many of us in the philanthropic community and outside of the philanthropic community assume that Holocaust survivors that we are fortunate to still have with us today are well taken care of by their family or by service agencies. Whoops. Um, nope. Sorry, Joel, my assistant. <laughs> um, we, um, we saw that survivors are being helped and supported by primary resources, by government, by the claims conference, and by local um, Jewish agencies. But sadly, these primary critical sources of support are just not enough. The resources are exhausted and there's still a great need. So in March 2019, at the JFN conference, um, we launched Survivors of the Holocaust Emergency Fund, CHEF, in Israel and in the United States and began to seek partners to join us in this new philanthropic partnership model. And we approached this initiative with two major goals. Obviously, the first goal is increasing the resources available to this suffering and vulnerable population. And the second goal was really to start to increase the awareness about this crisis. And our hope was that people across the country and in Israel would learn about this crisis and what was happening or actually not happening in their own communities. In the United States, we forged a partnership with Kavod and created a unique model to raise awareness and funds on two levels, on a national level and on a local level. 
On a national level, we currently have 18 philanthropic partners who joined us and see the dream matches every dollar donated at the national level with 100% of all funds raised going directly to emergency services for survivors. On the local level, partnerships were formed with Jewish agencies and federations where their locally raised um, funds for survivors were matched by the national coalition dollars. Kavod Survivor of the Holocaust Emergency Fund, Kavod Chef, is exponentially increasing dollars available for survivors across the country. Emergency services covered by this philanthropic partnership model include food, medical, emergency home care, urgent home repair needs, hearing aids, dental care, vision, and transportation. And actually when we set out, we originally designed this to be work across 12 local communities. And in less than one year, the Kavod Chef Coalition now includes 22 communities. And we are gearing up for more as several other cities have approached us to request support for 2020. And this, this was all happening even before the coronavirus um, pandemic hit. Little did we understand how vital it would be now with this pandemic to have this system in place where increased need for emergency services could quickly be accessed and distributed. And as we all see, this pandemic shines a spotlight on those most vulnerable, um, on those most vulnerable, exacerbating an already dire situation. Survivors' needs today are heightened because of the coronavirus, as access and delivery of food and medicine, emergency rent, even availability and continuity for in-home care are all compromised. And social isolation now having more practical and emotional consequences. The Kavod Chef phone hotline instituted at the start of our initiative provides access for survivors who had not yet been in contact with local agencies. This point of connection has become even more critical now during this time of increased isolation. In this past March alone, 500 requests were filled by Kavod Chef for emergency services, which is more than we saw in any months from the past year. Together with one of our wonderful national partners, the Sephardic Home for the Aged Foundation, and you'll hear from Josh in a minute, we at See the Dream were able to issue COVID emergency aid grants to each one of our Kavod Chef local communities to address the additional emergency needs occurring during this challenging time. The additional COVID emergency dollars also provided increased outreach to survivors and any emergency home care now requested. In the years since we began, the Kavod Chef team has been working and had been working tirelessly to deliver desperately needed funds and services to survivors, and now even more so. We are witnessing up close the power of philanthropic partnership. Kavod Chef begins with a national partnership with philanthropists and foundations and brings together a local level partnership with Federation and Jewish Family Service Agencies in each community while also working together with the JFNA. This model brings local and national dollars together, exponentially increases resources and raises awareness and is helping, helping, really helping to care for our survivors in need. As I mentioned, we now have over 18 national philanthropic partners and I wanna thank each of them, some of them on this call, some of them you'll hear from, for stepping up and understanding the suffering wanting to help and wanting to really be active in this silent crisis. Some of these philanthropists have, um, and foundations have serving Holocaust survivors or vulnerable populations as their core focus. Others do not. We are grateful for all our partners and fortunate to have three of our partners on the call today to share more about this critical need, discuss the priorities within their philanthropy and the difference we can make when we work together. I'm so honored and really, really happy to um, introduce Sherry Aronson, Cindy Shapira, and Josh Hoffman, three very important valued partners in Kavod Chef. Thank you so much for being here again and thank you for listening today. Hi, thank you Marcy for that introduction. I am Sherry Aronson and continue uh, in telling your incredible story and commitment to this cause. I continue to be inspired about how you use your family story to build awareness about the needs of Holocaust survivors and to encourage others to get involved. I was lucky to attend your session at the JFN conference in San Francisco last year. 
And there I heard Jeff Schoenfeld remark that the first grant any Jewish philanthropist should make is to, is to support survivors in their needs to maintain their dignity. This is especially true of foundations whose mission includes helping vulnerable populations. While I recognize, while this resonates deeply with you and Joel, I believe this is an area all of us in the Jewish community have responsibility to address. That is why I, on behalf of our family foundation, made a decision to get involved as soon as I learned about your effort. Truth be told, our foundation has not articulated support for Holocaust survivors as a key priority. However, that said, almost all of our family foundation giving is to vulnerable populations. Our grants support collaboration and strong leadership as a core value and something we prioritize in our decision making. See the dreams leadership and vision to bring, a, to, to bring together multiple federations and human service agencies along with funders to coordinate a response resonated for me. Because of Marcy, Seed the Dream, and the entire team, we understand there are many more pockets of survivors throughout our country who deserve a dignified existence. One with limited stresses related to just human needs of meals, medication, rent, and other basic needs. I applaud your ambitious plan to support even more communities going forward. Um, it's my understanding that we're gonna, you're going to be in 25 communities this coming year. This is work is so important now more than ever, given as forced isolation due to coronavirus has exacerbated many of the challenges that this community has been working to address over the past year. I want to close now by sharing that our family is very proud to support your efforts and we contributed in, we contributed to this effort in 2019 and will again contribute this year. I sincerely hope that many of you on this call and are hearing from the funders will consider joining me and others to address this pressing need within our own community because if we don't do it, who will? Thank you. Thank you, Anel. Cindy? Yes, hi, I'm here. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm so honored to be part of this call and please excuse the distraction. Um, but I have a very smiley seven month old, so she must think that this is um, a really good meeting as well. Um, I, you know, I, I think that Marcy so well laid out um, the, the need and uh, the work um, of this collaboration and what uh, her foundation, her and Joel's foundation is doing. And, and, and Sherry, I think you put a really fine point on it and, and pointed out um, uh, the reasons for collaboration uh, by other foundations. So I really can't add to that. I mean, the, the, the need is obvious. Um, uh, it's, it's made even more uh, compelling uh, by the COVID-19 crisis that we're all going through. Um, and these relatively small dollars uh, that are going out to help survivors are critically important to them. Um, and it's absolutely our duty uh, to, to make sure uh, that they have their, their basic and even not so basic needs taken care of. So I won't elaborate on that. The only thing I would add is that um, from the point of view of, uh, of, of David uh, and myself um, and our foundation, um, we think uh, collaboration is critically important. And while many of us with our foundations have a focus point, um, for us it's uh, um, Jewish identity building and, and focusing on, uh, I guess, next gen, uh, if you will, uh, commitment and engagement with their, their Jewishness and with Israel. Um, we think it's critically important, though, to collaborate with uh, foundations that are doing great work um, and, and to do so 
even through the lens of relationship um, and knowing that there are great people behind these foundations. So that we know that there, there are obviously behind the Aronsons and uh, behind uh, Seed the Dream, uh, the professionals obviously, as well as the funders. And that's almost reason enough for us to say, we're gonna be part of this because we believe in you and we believe in the great work that you're doing. And you know what? If you're telling us we should partner with you, we're gonna partner with you. That's almost enough for us. So I, I think that's really important. Relationships are important. And the only other point I'll make is that even if your foundation isn't critically focused on this area, what makes the world of Jewish philanthropy absolutely unique is that with each of us doing what we feel is important and also supporting each other, we really do cover the world, right? We, 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 we cover the needs, we cover the issues, we take care of our own and we ensure that there's a Jewish future. And for me, that's the important part too. It doesn't need to be everybody's primary focus. The idea is that with each of us doing our thing yet coming together, uh, we, we cover it all. Um, and, and I think that that is uh, an absolutely beautiful example um, that, that we all should acknowledge and participate in. So I'm so glad to see so many people I know. I've got it in gallery view. Um, I feel like romper room. I'll say hi to Jeff and I'll <laughs> say hi to Jane, et cetera. Um, but uh, uh, all of you are so special and uh, this meeting is so special. Thank you, Andres. Uh, for putting it together. And again, I'm, I'm proud and honored to be part of this effort, as is David. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Marcy, Joel, and Talia at Seed the Dream Foundation. And thanks to Shari and Cindy for sharing uh, your supportive words. And once again, thanks to everyone for joining today. My name is Joshua Hoffman, and I'm with the Sephardic Home for the Aged Foundation. We're a fairly new foundation that was created from the sale of the Sephardic Home for the Aged, a nursing care facility that served the Sephardic and other Jewish communities for decades. We're a foundation that was created to do one thing, support Jewish older adults. And so the Kavot Chef Initiative is core to our mission. I joined the foundation last year and we recently concluded a process that resulted in a set of values and priorities, chief among them being a commitment to the financial, emotional, and physical support for Holocaust survivors. So when I heard about the Kavod Chef Initiative at FedLab this past November, I knew that this was a critical initiative that is both extremely time sensitive and potentially historic in nature, and one that we had to partner with right away. Our previous speakers today really laid out the facts of the crisis and the critical needs that survivors have, especially today with COVID-19, a part of our lives. And I just want to further stress the importance of partnership here as we collectively try to address the crisis that survivors are in right now. Holocaust survivors are in every community and we need funding partners from every community, regardless of priorities, to step up and step into this partnership so that we can care for the last of the survivors and allow them to not only live with their basic needs being met, but allow them to live out their lives with dignity, respect, and kavod, honor. Kavod is what we owe to the survivors and kavod, the organization, has stepped up with Seed the Dream and the rest of the funding partners to get this partnership off the ground. We need everyone to join us in whatever way that they can and the way to do that is to contact uh, Seed the Dream and Talia Kaplan. Thank you very much for attending today. And I hope that we as a community and as a partnership are able to bring Kavod to survivors right away. Thank you. Um, Joel's gonna close it, but I just wanna thank you, Josh. That was, that was beautiful. Thank you, Cindy, amazing, and Sherry. Wow, what partners we have, what partners we, we um, how lucky are we and how lucky are the survivors that people care. And there was one person I forgot to thank was Talia um, and our staff um, at See the Dream who, what I really wanna thank them is for caring so much and caring so much about this issue and really understanding the importance of pushing, pushing me to do this, um, pushing us to, to be front and center with this because um, we were, we're 
we wouldn't be able to be here without the people as 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 Sherry, Cindy, and Josh all said, and uh, others know that without our, our incredible staff and the staff at Kavod as well, but our staff makes this happen. It makes the reality of this um, happen. So I didn't want to um, neglect to, to point out that we are at, uh, a team uh, at See the Dream and how lucky are we as well. Thank you, Marcy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so I, I echo and parrot what Marcy said about thanking everyone who already spoke and especially Marcy who's been the spearhead of, of this of this initiative helped so many survivors in need. So I, I'm going to just speak for a very few minutes to summarize and give a few, a few more details about how the program works and then open it up with I think we've left 10-15 minutes for Q&A so if people have specific questions about where we are what we're doing how it works then feel free we're, we're hoping for questions. So I, I I want to start off by saying that this, this initiative, both in the United States and in Israel, is, is very, very efficient. We, we, chose, we chose our partners on the ground very carefully in, in, uh, in, that, in the United States, Kavod, to make sure that the, the maximum dollars are reaching the survivors in terms of what they need. So we at See the Dream uh, are covering all the overhead and, and the turnaround time from from when a survivor says that they need something, which comes through a social service agency, is very, very short. Uh, so that it's not weeks, it's days, uh, to make sure the survivor is getting what they need, because by definition, these are emergency situations that have to be addressed immediately. I would also say that uh, millions of dollars are in, in, a, in our initiative alone, and that's a combination of See the Dream, our national partners, some of whom have already spoke, and I'll address in one second how the local communities are also pitching in. But it, it's an effort that we, uh, as Marcia said, were not really involved in six or seven years ago, and now it's become a, a primary focus given the dire situation that's facing many survivors, uh, both here in the United States and, and around the world. Um, and I, I want to address the two different initiatives we have, because I know we have some people who are focused on Israel, some people are focused on the United States and some people are focused on both. So I just wanted to take a moment to talk about each initiative. So the way it works in the United States is that uh, See the Dream, our family foundation, has set up a, a fund to match any national partner who donates to that national fund. Uh, and we, have, uh, we also have, uh, besides the three that spoke, we, I think we have an additional uh, 15 to 20 national partners who are contributing to the National Fund, uh, the, the Saban Foundation, I think Amitai so is on the call, Cheryl Haim have, have been very, very helpful from the beginning. Uh, so the way it works is that if someone, for example, donates $100,000 to the National Fund, See the Dream, our, our family foundation matches that, and that creates $200,000. And then we, in terms of these local communities, which we started with 12, then it went to 18, now we're on our way to 25. The net, the, and, and let's say that one of the local communities is Chicago. We, Chicago would, the local federation or local Jewish family services would, would be tasked with raising 200,000 to help their, their survivors who are in emergency need. And then this national fund would also match that local, local commitment of 200,000. So now there would be $400,000 that, that Chicago could use to help their survivors who are in need. Another way of looking at that is if you're a national partner and you, and you join us at the national level, you put up 100,000, our family foundation puts up 100,000, and the locals put up 200,000. So your 100,000 has turned into to 400,000, so you're really getting a three to one match, which is the way Marcy and I and Ty and others designed it to really incent people to want to donate because you really it's you're getting three to three to one match on your hundred thousand dollars and all, all that money is going directly to survivors in emergency need and and the donations that have come to the to the uh, to the national fund that we have matched have ranged from anywhere from twenty five thousand dollars up to one hundred fifty thousand dollars of course we'll accept more than one hundred fifty thousand dollars but so far that's on top of we're, we're going to match anything above that. Uh, and the way, and in Israel, it's a little bit different because the, there aren't these national community, uh, local communities. In Israel, what we've done, uh, there are three major aid organizations, survivors, 
cabaret aid organizations. And we've set up matching funds at each of those three organizations that cover the entire, the entire gamut of survivors in Israel from north to south, east to west. Uh, there we're matching one-to-one, -one, so it's not quite as good a bargain, but still a pretty good bargain. So you're getting, uh, at least your, your dollars matched on a one-to-one -one basis. In the United States, it's being matched actually on a one-to-one basis. And before I open it up for questions and answers, I, I just want to stress that time really is of the essence. This is not a, a, a 10, 20 year issue, very sadly. The average age of survivors throughout the world in the United States is 85. Um, and so that puts some parameters on what this, what this problem is. And it's an issue that really time is of the essence. And that's especially been highlighted during the pandemic. Uh, because the, the, the needs have, have grown exp exponentially. Uh, I also wanted to say that, uh, as uh, Cindy said, that really uh, whether, whether surv helping survivors is, is your main focus or not, and I said we, we've morphed some of our focus, but whether it's helping survivors or not, this really should be part of everyone's giving portfolio to whatever extent possible. And if survivors you know, are really a, a treasure, a treasure of the Jewish people. And, and I think that everyone has to, to look at what they're giving and how they're giving. And we, we really encourage people to, again, whether it's your focus or not your focus, to, get, to give some portion of your giving to this initiative. And just to, re, to recap the numbers, there are about 400,000 survivors left in the world. Uh, and no matter where they are, 25% minimum are living in poverty. In the United States, there's 80,000 survivors left. Of that, somewhere between 25,000 and 30,000 survivors in the United States are living in poverty. In Israel, there's 160,000 survivors. There, there's 60,000 survivors living in poverty. And then, sadly, in the former Soviet Union, it's, it's almost 100,000 survivors. 100% 100, 100 of the survivors are living in poverty. So at a minimum, just think about that. These people who have, who have suffered more than any people have suffered in the that we know in today's world, or maybe throughout history, have suffered more than any people. And at, at the end of their lives, 25%, ranging up to 100% of them are suffering, uh, you know, where, where, where we, we all have the means to alleviate some of that suffering. So Marcy and I, and the rest of the staff at Sea the Dream, our other national partners, some of them spoke very beautifully on this call, and many who are not on the call, uh, but have contributed immense amounts of dollars to this initiative, we really ask you to join with us while, we, while you still can. With that, Thank you. and we'll open it up to any questions anyone may, may have. Thank you so much for what you're doing. And thank you, Andres, really, for what you've done to give us the platform to allow us to address this most urgent need. Okay. Thank you, Marcy and Joel, and to all the presenters. I do want to open up. We have a few more moments for questions. There have, there's a few that have come in, some that you've answered with your remarks, so thank you for that, that have come in to me, and I'll ask this one, and we'll wait for another few questions to come in, um, is can you please talk about a community in which the model has worked particularly well, and that possibly could be helpful to others? Um, we have many, um, okay, and if it's okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put Talia on the spot, because she lives and breathes this, knows each community, and you can choose which um, community, Talia, you want to um, offer up as, a, an ex as a, one of our great examples. But there's no community where it has not worked well. Some places it's worked extremely well, but every community, in terms of serving the needs of the emergent needs of survivors, it's worked well. Yeah, I think that Joel's, thank, thank you, Joel and Marcy. Um, I think that Joel's answer um, is exactly right. In every community, it's, it's working. That our local partners, the, the partnership begins with the Federation. Um, and then we work together with the Jewish Family <laughs> Service Agency and together um, the national partners and the local partners are increasing the resources that are available for survivors and ensuring that the Holocaust survivor population of that community is able to access those dollars immediately and have their needs met. So we can mention that in Philadelphia, which was one of the first um, communities to join into this coalition, that they came in very quickly, that the Federation increased the allocations um, to 
this initiative and, and to survivors in the community. And then immediately the survivors were able to begin accessing every one of those dollars in every area of that need. And a tremendous amount of those dollars has gone toward food, especially during this pandemic. Um, and those allocations have only continued to increase. And the Federation has also worked with us to increase those dollars over these last few months. So as needs continue to grow, the Kabod Chef Fund has also grown for that community. And that's happening across the country. So Philadelphia is one example, but in every one of the 20 plus communities that's going to be growing to the 25 communities, we're seeing the exact same scenario that the dollars are being raised, um, awareness is being raised, press releases are going out, new survivors are able to access these funds, and, um, and needs are being met, and the needs are continuing to grow. I just want to add what Ty just said also in terms of how well it's working. I mean, as you can imagine, the delivery of food in these times in terms of volunteers, not being sure they wanted to go out who had previously been delivering food or, or how to get the food to the survivors in a very safe way. Thanks to Josh and his organization, they, they partnered with us and we were able to very quickly come up with an efficient way paying, to actually pay outside services who are in the business of developing food to take the place of some of the volunteers. So the whole goal of this is to act very, very quickly and respond quickly to the survivors' needs. That's great. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have time for one more question to be answered very briefly, and I just also wanna offer up, I see more questions are coming. And everybody on the call, you can reach out to me at tamar at jfunders.org, and I can connect you to any of, the, any of the speakers today to learn more about this really important initiative. Um, I just, I don't, I wanna give us a lot of time for questions, but we have such an, uh, an incredible opportunity for commemoration in just a few moments. So with and our last few moments, I wanted to ask is, what do you see as the most pressing need? Is it food, medicine, home care? And I can leave that to Marcy and Joel to speak to that. And also if any of the fellow panelists want to, to jump in in those last few moments. Thank you. The, the, the most pressing need is actually money because mm -hmm. every community is different. And so every community, it depends. Some survivors, like there was a community, uh, I think in Cleveland that needed, before the pandemic, needed hearing aids for 50 survivors. So we were very quickly able to work with a hearing aid company that gave us a discount. And we were able to, to, uh, to use some of the national funds matched by local Cleveland dollars, so in part, to, to raise the money to, to pay for those hearing aids. Obviously in the pandemic, some of that changed, but food became more important, medicine. But every community and every survivor is different and what they need. I think the, the beauty of, this, of what we set up is that we have a, a, a broad range of dollars, a broad range of services funded by the dollars that can address the survivor's need. And we, we didn't want to dictate, well, we're only going to do this for emergency needs. Every emergency need is, is looked at individually and then, and, and then quickly addressed. So uh, the most, as I said, the most important need is money. Because the more money we have, the more, the more money we have, the more money will match the, the dollars that come in. And then we can quickly get those out into the field to, to where they're most needed. Thank you so much. And with that, I'm about to ask Andres to come back on to introduce our next speakers. And, and before we go into the commemoration, I want to thank again um, Joel and Marcy and Sherry, Cindy, and Josh for sharing, for sharing all of this with us today about this important initiative. I also want to ask everybody to please continue to stay muted. And also, if you want to take yourself and stop video, um, because we're going to have some shared screens and we think it would be a better experience for everybody if everybody um, is off of the screen besides the, the one or two speakers. Thank you so much. And Andres, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Damar, and thank you to the panelists. And it's, it's, it's heartwarming to see the work that many around the world are doing to help survivors and 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 now we're going to shift gears a little bit to although not completely uh to talk about memory and and it's kind of interesting because now in this day and age when when we're doing everything virtually it's a good opportunity to think about the different forms in which we can exercise memory and we can remember uh, and create collective memories of of the of of our of our you know uh, most important historical events, either good or or bad. So this 
So the, the part that follows now is, is actually two things. It is in a way, of course, a commemoration of the Holocaust and an opportunity to honor the survivors among us, but it's also a reflection on the new ways in which memory can work in this digital age. Whether we're forced into a digital age because of coronavirus or whether we just use digital tools to reach more populations and more people and to set and to and to expand the message of memory and honor to the victims of the Holocaust. So the pioneers of this type of work, among many others, uh, is the USC Shoah Foundation. And it's a, a big honor to introduce um, Stephen Smith from the Shoah Foundation to lead us in this in this segment of this. Uh, of this encounter. Uh, Stephen, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Andres, very much. And I want to say uh, a real big thank you to Jewish Funders Network for putting the needs of survivors uh, right at the front of the agenda today on Yom HaShoah, because it's so easy just to look back at the, the past and reflect. But when those individuals who have told us their stories and have um, been so open with their lives um, are in great need, um, ensuring that we are thinking about them in the present is so important. And thank you for all the efforts of everybody that's participated in Kavod Chef and Marcy and Joel uh, for your leadership, which is really, really remarkable. And thank you for that. I'm joined today um, by Holocaust survivor Pinkas Gutter, who's going to share this segment with us. And in fact, uh, when I met Pinkas for the very first time, going back to the night, night, um, one of the things that really struck me was that Pinkas as a Holocaust survivor, was working to support um, elderly people in the Jew generally, um, but also um, other Holocaust survivors. And Pinkus, as you've been listening to this conversation, um, what, what strikes you as somebody that works in Toronto, where you live today, with the survivor community, and in, in indeed supporting them with their needs? I know that you're very in that. The situation is here is that uh, we we have um, we have several agencies that help Holocaust survivors. Uh, unfortunately, one of the things that I found when we started is that it was very difficult because uh, people believe that in Canada medical uh, is supported by government then Holocaust survivors are well looked after, but they weren't. For example, I'll give you a, tell you a story. A man came to me and he said, uh, my wife needs, uh, need, need, needs to wear these white, you know, she's incontinent and she needs those, whatever you call them, I've forgotten what you, what you call them, those things. And it's a question whether I can have food or buy for her these incontinent things for her to put, to put on. And this struck me very much. And um, the fact is that we don't get money from the government for glasses, we don't get for dental, we don't get for many, many things, for walkers. And we, need to have a, we needed to have an emergency fund. Now, the claims conference at one stage had money because they used to they got the uh, from the German government they got all those properties which were given back to the Jewish community and uh, they didn't have any heirs so from that money was some of this money was sent and spent for emergency funds so we we have got uh, over a thousand or eleven hundred people who need on a daily basis medical uh, um, for example, if they, if they live in isolation often, uh, for example, if they con air conditioner or their fridge packs up, we have to help them up. And uh, that is what I'm doing. I'm, I, I chair a committee at Jewish Family and Child, which looks after this particular instance. And we need Thank more you. and more money. We need money. And thank, you. thank you for your service. It it's remarkable that you are 88 years and giving your service to the community and to other Holocaust survivors. And, and so fitting that you're part of this conversation um, with the, the Jewish Funders Network today. And thank you for that. 
I'm going to move um, Pinchas to, to talk a little bit about some of the work that we're doing around testimony, because in addition to the work you're doing with uh, the community, um, you've been a very active um, educator. As everybody on the call, I'm sure, is aware, USC Shoah Foundation has uh, over 5,000 testimonies of the Holocaust and of other genocides, the vast majority of them survivors of the Holocaust who have shared their personal stories at great length and in great pain in many cases. Uh, Pincus, you're one of them uh, among those 55,000 and thank you for sharing your testimony. But today we're going to have a conversation uh, as part of our commemoration about what it means um, in the future to continue to tell those stories. And Pincus has been a pioneer with the Shoah Foundation in thinking through um, how do we continue to tell our story in a way that will engage the next generation of learners. Before we jump in, um, some of you might have seen a few weeks um, its uh, segment about a particular project which Pincus was uh, helping Mr. Pioneer called Dimensions in Testimony. And Kia, whose foundation is on, on the line here with us, I hope is going to be able to share her screen and just show you a brief um, segment of that uh, short piece from 60 Minutes. And just one word of warning, everybody. Uh, we're going to be showing you quite a lot of technology over the next 25 minutes. And as we know about, about technology, it sometimes works. So if you can bear with us, we're very reliant on Zoom here. And if we find it's a little choppy, we'll, we'll take a different strategy. So, Kia, maybe you just show us a minute of that uh, uh, broadcast. not hearing the sound yeah. um. so dramatically can you sing me a song from your youth yeah don't you cheat. it's a story of history hope survival and resilience which has its roots in another time when the world was convulsed by crisis world war ii aaron tell us what your parents did before the war they owned and operated a butcher shop this interview was unlike any we have ever done. Keep your mentality, keep your soul, keep your mind. Incredibly, Aaron Elster, a Holocaust survivor, died two years ago. What's the weather like today? I'm actually recording. I cannot answer that question. So you see Leslie Stahl was uh, interviewing Pincus um, at the Illinois Holocaust um, Education Center um, as a part of that uh, uh, segment. In fact, the, the project that I mentioned is in testament, and we sat and we asked Pincus about almost 2,000 questions about his life a few years ago. Um, now, um, you can see in Holocaust museums and classrooms um, in which young people uh, and old people, anybody, um, can have a conversation with Pincus through his interactive video. Pinkus, I want to ask you the question about Tammy. Um, when did you begin to tell the story and how has that changed over time? Uh, just repeat that. I didn't hear quite what you asked. When, when did you begin to tell your personal story and how has that changed over time? Well, I, the first time I told my story uh, is... Uh, is when I stopped telling my story. And that was in 1967 or 68. I was asked to speak at Yom HaShoah. At the, I was living in South Africa and I was, I was asked to speak at the cemetery in East London for, because a friend of mine knew. I didn't tell people I was a Holocaust survivor. He knew and his brother wanted to have somebody because they didn't have anybody to speak. So I went to speak there and I prepared... A, a, a long speech about not only about uh, the Holocaust, but about because being in South Africa, I also involved iniquity about all of you know the apartheid and so forth and so on. And when I finished and we came back to the house to have a little tea and so forth, so on, I started shaking and shivering so much so that one of the doctors, I think, put something in my tea and uh, I, I slept for 12 hours. Uh, without waking up because I was so so disturbed and after that I didn't speak until 1992 
until 1992 when I came to, I was living in Canada and a professor, Professor Paula Draper was there doing history for the Neuberger Holocaust Center here in Toronto. I started telling them and then I started getting involved. And since then, I've traveled 17 times to Poland and Germany with, with mainly non-Jewish students, postgraduate students, telling them that. And I've been involved in general education. I've been at Harvard and I've been at uh, different universities in, in many universities in, uh, in Canada and the United States, uh, mainly col uh, Catholic universities because they, they've got very good programs for Holocaust education. And I think it's terribly important to be able not only to tell the story of what happened, but also to tell not the iniquity, but also how much there was enormous, uh, uh, an enormous empathy amongst the prisoners and, and what actually happened. I mean, to give you an example, when I had typhoid in Scarcisco Camiena, one of, the, one of the real working death camps, and, and, and I was just recovering slowly at night, working night shift. One of the women who was working there, Jewish women, came and gave me an apple. In the two and a half years I was in the Warsaw Ghetto, I never saw an apple. So she took something from her and gave it to this little boy who was then 11, 12 years old, so he should recover. Now, this, and the, and, and, and the spiritual uh, involvement, it, it's just incredible. And this is what I try to relate to people, that amongst all this iniquity, there was an enormous amount of goodness and, 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 and empathy and feelings and emotions from people. Uh, and and it's, it wasn't all, it, it wasn't, it, it was something quite extraordinary. And I think when you are able to, to actually tell people exactly how it happened, how it, or what happened, I think it's different than people who are university professors who, who, who are very good at telling the stories and everything. But when you are a witness, a person who actually was there, and you can say, I saw it, I did it, I was, pa I was part of this, it makes an enormous impression. So just a second, uh, Pinkos, we're going to uh, see a uh, uh, interview. Uh, is going to share with us on her screen in just a second. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions with the interaction. Uh, for those of you on the call, if you can use the um, uh, box, if you've got questions that you would like to put on his virtual interview, just type them in there and we'll be able to see those um, and to, uh, pick a couple out. But maybe I'll just hand over to you for one second, Kia, just to um, introduce Pinchus is interview as part of the Dimensions in Testimony program. If you share your screen. By the way, this has never been done before over Zoom, so let's just see what happens. Always on the cutting edge. And Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to ask Pincus a couple of questions. Stephen, just let me know if um, you can hear on your end. Hello, how That's are fine. you? Not too bad. May we ask you some questions? You can ask me any questions you like. Pinkus, why do you share your story? The main reason why I tell my story in public is because, number one, I would like people to know what can happen. And number two, I try and then teach them tolerance. I like to bring goodwill and tolerance to the world. And by telling the worst, I try to, that what can happen, I try then to tell them that if I speak, for example, if I speak at the school and their school has got black people, Asiatic people and others, I try and convey to them that they, everybody is the same. Everybody should be treated like a human being. We're all good, we're all bad. We all have got the same souls. We all 
basically have the same God and we must try and be, you know, like brothers, you know, in, and, and treat each other like a brotherhood of human beings. So that is the main reason. Uh, and I'd like to invite if anyone would um, like me to ask Pincus's Dimensions and Testimony System a question, I'd be happy to take it. Um, oh, I actually believe that there is a question. Okay, could you ask Pincus about his sister? Sure. Can you tell us about your sister? To be quite honest, I know, apart from our infancy, which I remember very clearly when we shared a room and we had two cots on each side when we were maybe a year, a year and a half, and I've got a very visual memory of all that, I had very little to do with my sister because as soon as you started growing up as a little boy, you were separated in Hasidic in, in, in our culture, Hasidic culture, girls and boys did not mix. Um, there's a question from Andres, which is, um, where did, uh, which camps and ghettos were you in? Which camps and ghettos were you in? When my father arrived in Warsaw, he looked for an apartment, found a, a little apartment on Nalewki number 49, and when the ghetto was formed, uh, that apartment happened to have been part of the ghetto. And that's how we found ourselves in the ghetto. And then after the ghetto, which camps were you in? I was sent from the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising to Majdanek. I was in Majdanek for approximately from third week of May to the end of July, beginning of August. I was in Skarzysko for a whole year, from August to August. Also from August, end of July or May to Tisha. I remember I was there until Tisha B'Av, well, but I don't know when Tisha B'Av, one can actually check up when Tisha B'Av was in 1944, and I would know exactly how long I was there. And then from there I was sent to change to Chova, at Ironworks, where I was there for approximately uh, September, October, November. I was then sent to Buchenwald. I was in Buchenwald for about not more than two or three weeks because there you didn't get anything to eat, despite the fact that the administration tried. And uh, I was from there, I was taken by Hasak, the people that I had been working for all the time, the Hugo Schneider Axion Gesellschaft to a place called Kolditz, where I spent from about January to beginning of April. From April, I was on a death march from, from Kolditz to Theresienstadt. I was in Theresienstadt for a couple of weeks when I was liberated by the Russian army. Um, Pincus, I'm coming back to you in just one second, but if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask Pincus another question, which is from Vicky, um, which is where did you go when you, when you were liberated. Where did you go when you were liberated? I started off by living in Czechoslovakia for several months. I was then in England. From England, I went to France. From France, I went to Israel. From Israel, I went back to England. From England, then I went to South America, to Brazil. From Brazil, I went to South Africa. And finally, from South Africa, I went to Toronto, where I live now. And Pincus, you've been, um, you know, work, working on this project for a, a good time now. I wanted to ask you a question about why you chose to do this project um, and what it was like in, uh, to leave your memory in this form for future generations. That's for you, that's for actually for you, Pinchas, not for Oh, Virgin. you want me to answer that? Well, <laughs> yes. I, I, yeah, well, you know, I don't know because the pictures, I'm not on the picture there, so 
uh, I'm just seeing my, uh, yeah, I'm seeing you, but uh, I, I, I'm not, I, I'm kind of a little square at the bottom there. So, no, no, basically the reason why is because, as I said before, I think it's terribly important to be able to interact with a survivor, with a witness. I mean, I, I believe that the more witnesses there are of, of anything that can happen, which is uh, uh, with, of any type of iniquity, genocide or anything like that, I think it, could, it, 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 would, it would teach people that are normally not involved in this, who don't see it, who, who, who maybe see it on a flat screen on television and then they forget about it on the news and how many people actually listen to the news. So I think when, when, when you approached me originally in 2000, I think in, in 2013 or something, to start this project and nobody believed that it might be successful, I believe immediately that if you could in future afterwards interact with Holocaust survivors, more, with, with quite a few Holocaust survivors, and, and be with them and, and listen to them, to listen to their voice, answering questions that people impromptu ask them, and being able to uh, 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 respond, and being able to interact with them, and be able to convey to them exactly what happened, how it happened, and, and, and how the thing evolved from the beginning, not only from, from, from uh, later on, but right from the beginning. I mean, uh, people don't realize, for example, when I tell them that when the German army uh, uh, came in to uh, uh, attack Poland, they saw a troop of scouts, young scouts. They weren't Jews. There may have been a couple of Jewish scouts amongst them too. They were wearing uniforms. And they were just ordinary scouts. They knew that these were scouts, but they decided this, this, this was, this, these were nasty individuals. They just put them against the wall and they shot them. And this was 1939. This was before the, the, the final solution. They did the same things in many towns where they surrounded, they took Jews uh, immediately and they started shooting and killing. And, and that's the type of thing that was long before the final solution. Now, this is the type of thing that you don't really uh, uh, understand how human beings can act under different circumstances. And it's only a witness, somebody who saw what's happening, somebody who saw on the, after a weeks of, of, uh, of Germans being in Wuj to come and take their father away and almost beat him to death, which was my father, take him to the wine cellars and beat him to death and, and, and then it was a, a, a non-Jewish, uh, 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 a non-Jewish Catholic uh, 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 um, man who found him in 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 the cellar and brought him to our home, risked his life. You know, the, he was the caretaker of the complex, and he didn't see saw them taking him down, but they didn't. See, he didn't come out when they all left after they destroyed everything that was there for a hundred years. Now, how can you convey this unless you actually, it's okay, you can have the testimony, you can talk the story, but it doesn't make the same effect when people answer the question, what happened to you when the Germans entered Poland? And you can tell them that first time by interaction with them. And the proof is in the pudding. I mean, people interact with me and they think that I'm actually real. I mean, I've seen it. I've sat at, at, in, 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 in Chicago and in other places, in, in Toronto, where we had this new dimensions, and people would actually thank me. They would uh, apologize for asking me in adult, in a, in the ordinary questions, and so forth and so on. So there is this kind of personal interaction, which I, I can't believe. Most people, uh, the, the emails that I've received afterwards, they say that, that this is something they will never ever be able to forget, and it's something that will be indelible in their mind. Thank you, Pincus. So, um, we've been working together for a number of years, and you know, the Show Foundation is asking, so what are our priorities? And in fact, alongside work that uh, Marcy and Joel have been describing around the urgency of the care for survivors, 
We've been working together, Pincus, in, as you know, about the urgency of making sure the story is. And in fact, Show Foundation finished collecting testimony in 2000. We have started again with a project called the Last Chance Testimony Program, by which we are, as soon as this pandemic is over, we'll be back in um, the homes of Holocaust survivors. Some of us have, ha have had some severe loss over the last uh, few weeks when Holocaust survivors a few weeks ago were alive and now passed as a result of this terrible disease that we're facing. Um, but the other thing that's happened and has, has come up as a result of this pandemic, um, we're seeing a change. Um, for example, we were all due to be at the March of the Living in uh, Poland this week, and the Show Foundation's board were all going to be there with the tens of thousands of people from around the world. That are and in fact, tomorrow it's going to be just, but we're going to be convening online instead. But one of the things that also Pink has helped us to uh, pioneer was telling it on location. And one of the things that we want to do is make future years have you on the show and tens of thousands of young people go, for example, to Poland to experience that. Obviously, in years to come, survivors will not. And so what we've been doing, we've been interviewing survivors location. So the very survivors like Pinchas and others who have been going on March of the Living or March of Remembrance and Hope um, over many years um, go to those sites and we film them. We don't just film them with a regular camera, we film them with a 360 camera. So now what can happen is in future, young people are going to be able to go to those places, to the Krakow ghetto, to Łódź, to Warsaw, to um, Kosciuszko, wherever they might go, and stand in the location and experience the testimony in the place where it happened and where the testimony was given. What we're going to be able to do is use uh, technologies like augmented reality, by which, for example, people be able to stand in the streets of Warsaw where on Nalewki 19 was where his father found that apartment and, and tell us about that story in that place and tomorrow we're going to be launching that on the March of the Living webinar so please feel free to join that somebody will put the uh, commemoration in the chat box. Um, I think it will just with a few minutes we've got left um, Pinchas, I just want to ask you um, the one thing we'll do we'll just show you a very quick clip of Pinchas um, who went with uh, me and the Shoah Foundation team to Majdanek uh, death camp and was interviewed there in virtual reality. Um, and we'll just see a, a minute of this. I'm going to move to a final question or two for you, Pinchas. Okay, we'll show us that piece. Thank you, Kia. Give me some sound. pushed into those wagons to take us to the east. We didn't know where we were going. I come back to Majdanek, to this camp, to convey the truth of what actually happened. This place, this camp, was a place of torture. I think that you have to confront pain to be able to heal it. Unless you have somebody that can say, I was here, I saw this, this was done to me. I don't think people would accept it as the gospel truth. So that particular piece we did together, Pinkas, was a, a short film called The Last Goodbye, which I know is it all uh, in Toronto where you live and uh, around the country um, but Pinkas as we close our commemorative conversation today I want to ask you a final question you know when you think about the loss of your twin Sabina who you know you very movingly told us um, that you know she was your twin and yet to this very you don't have a recollection of her face with no photos of your family or of her and um, with that memory sort of lost to you on a day like today on your Mashoa, how do you personally reflect? And maybe you could just sort of lead us in a, a moment of personal reflection to close our, our event today. Um, it's, it's quite uh, amazing uh, what actually happens. You know, on your Mashoa, we always light 
I mean, I particularly like because my parents were murdered and my sister were murdered in Maidanek the day we arrived. So apart from the fact that on the eighth day of Pesach, we light memorial candles, Yisker candles, I also light them on Yom HaShoah. And uh, not only for my family, immediate family, but my grandparents, I mean, I've lost over 150 members, immediate family. I had lots of cousins and uncles and great uncles. But when I do that, I stand, you must have noticed in the last little bit of the last goodbye, that cupola where the mound of ashes is. And I don't know if you remember the first time that I went there with you, I broke down when I was reciting El Mola Rachamim. And whenever Yom HaShoah comes around, I am in actually not in Toronto. I am in Maidanek and I'm standing in front of the ashes and I'm visualizing, visualizing my parents, which I remember very well, and the braid of my sister, because I don't remember anything of hers. And I quietly, in my mind, recite the prayer. El mala rachamim, bam Lucas, thank you so much for sharing your personal story with us and for your bravery and for your courage and for representing today all the hundreds of thousands of Holocaust survivors who we've been hearing about um, through our program today who have needs and who have memories and today will be reflecting on their own families. Thank you for all that you do and for your leadership and for your courage um, for being such a shining light in our world. I'm going to hand it back to Andres. Thank you, Pinkfast. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And thank and, and, and thank you, Pinkfast, for your bravery. And when I think that our survivors are, are I mean, calling calling folks like Pinkha survivors is a misnomer. I think they're they're heroes and they're militants, they're militants of memory. And it was it was moving and it was very interesting also to see. This, this way of transmitting memory. Um, you know, that, uh, thousands of years ago, we transmitting, we, we used to transmit memories orally, then we invented writing and we transmit memories in writing. Then we invented the printing press. And, and maybe these, you know, holographic testimonies um, are probably another way that we are we're coming up for transmitting memories that are critical to to us. Um, I want to encourage each and every one of us tonight to light a candle, like Pinchas does every year, uh, for the people we lost personally and collectively, and to commit uh, to not let death, you know, have the last word. The last word is is ours. Is the is it belongs to the living, to those that want to uphold life and all the values that Pinchas was referring to. Um, tragedies in the Jewish people uh, make us more humane, uh, make us better. Uh, and that's how we face tragedy in our history and that's how we should uh, face it today. Um, especially now that we're facing a tragedy of our own, the loss of so many people to a, to a nasty, unexpected, you know, pandemic. And, um, and with that, I would just want to close with saying that it is important to keep the memory alive, but it's important also to keep people alive. And I think that the projects that we've been discussing uh, this morning um, to help the living Holocaust survivors among us are a way of really keeping the living alive. And I thank you everybody for doing what they do and for and for sharing your thoughts, your emotions and your experience with us. Thank you very, very much. And please um, uh, stay tuned to the different programs that the Jewish Funders Network is doing these days. 
uh, as a response to the to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, you can also check on our website for an uh, for an updated list of needs and philanthropic responses. So you can join your your peers and your fellow funders in assisting the community in these times. Thank you all very much, and uh, stay he stay healthy and safe. <laughs>